Today we will be talking about covalent bonds and how they form molecular compounds. The goal today is to be able to explain how the formation of a covalent bond is different from the formation of an ionic bond, as well as how some of those properties differ between the substances because of the different formation of the bonds. So to start, compared to ionic bonds, where I transfer electrons to be able to create the force of attraction, a covalent bond is going to share electrons. So in this situation, neither element is able to actually pull the electrons away from the other element, so they're going to share and that will allow both atoms in the bond to behave as though they're stable. Still going to be looking for that octet, but this time it won't form ions. Both atoms are going to have to share so they get to behave as though they're stable. There are two ways to share. If they both pull evenly and nobody has a difference of attraction for electrons, we would call that nonpolar. When you have different elements and one of them pulls tighter or has a stronger attraction for electrons than the other, we would then have a polar covalent bond where one atom is going to have the electrons closer to it during the bond. So what exactly is this polarity? Well, last unit we learned about this thing called electronegativity. And if you recall, that is the force of attraction that one atom has for another atom's electrons. In an ionic bond, one pulls so tightly it actually pulls the electrons away. But here, neither one has the ability to do that. They just pull maybe unevenly. When that happens and there's an uneven pull on the electrons, that creates different ends of the molecule. The side where the electrons spend more of their time will have a partial negative charge, whereas the side of the molecule that has less electrons will have a partial positive charge. So if all of the negative particles are hanging out on one side, like you see down below in B, we see that this end gets that little delta, that's a um, Greek letter that means partial. So the blue side here is indicating the electrons are more concentrated on that side. And the red side here is indicating that it's partially positive because the electrons aren't very close to it. So all you really have is that hydrogen nucleus. Now when neither side pulls unevenly, like in the example of this diatomic molecule, chlorine, each chlorine is going to pull evenly. So the electrons all evenly spread throughout the molecule. So polarity happens when one of the elements in the bonds has a bigger electronegativity so that it has a stronger attraction for electrons and then you get opposite charges in different parts of the molecule. So we talked before about a molecule as being a particle that has covalent bonds within it. So notice that this particle is neutral. There is no overall charge within a molecule. The electrons coming in from all of the different atoms are still all of the electrons that are accounted for. Carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and the diatomic molecules. Hofbrinkel is a way to remember which ones do that. Those are the elements that create doubles. So think about like oxygen in the atmosphere. That's listed as O2. All of the elements in the Hoff-Brinkle acronym do the same thing. They naturally exist as two of those atoms covalently bonded together. They're more stable that way. Now a molecular compound is still a molecule, but it must have different elements within the particle. So water is a great example of that. There are two hydrogens and one oxygen. So a molecular compound is made up of molecules that are made of different elements. Now just a reminder, there are two that you are required to memorize. NH3, we learned, was ammonia, 
not ammonium like NH4 plus, and CH4 is methane. These two names they're more commonly known by because of their properties. So it's important if I would ask you that on a test or a quiz, these are the names and formulas that should match together. Now when we look at the properties of molecular and ionic compounds, the attractions between them can help account for the different properties we see. So remember that ionic we said is a formula unit. We can't refer to it as a molecule because it doesn't exist in those discrete particles. The metals and the nonmetals form these bonds because that's where the difference in electronegativity is great enough that I have an exchange or transfer of electrons. Because of that strong force of attraction, They have very high melting or boiling points and are usually solid at room temperatures because it would take a lot of energy to disrupt those attractions. Now when I look at molecular compounds, remember that a molecule is the particle that makes it up. The covalent bonds within the molecule is going to be between two nonmetals. And there are different ways that the electrons can be shared. That goes back to that difference in electronegativity. What we notice, though, is that molecules are neutral, so their forces of attraction between them are weaker. So because the par particles themselves aren't actually charged the way they are in ionic compounds, that force of attraction is weaker and it takes less energy to melt or boil them. So typically these substances are gases or liquids at room temperatures. At this point, you should do a check. This is the end of how covalent bonds form. And the next step of the process, we're going to go into a discussion of how to draw models of these different types of bonds.